This mindless assembly of bones appeared out of thin air, teleporting to random locations in Northworld to grab at the nearest living person, seeking to poke and clutch, but not harm. <laughs> A look at Northward. Northward has always been a prosperous, not noble old money, but wealthy and grasping after prominence district of Waterdeep. Though like all generalizations, this fails when one looks closely, for the North has its paupers, its clinging by fingertips to abode as shop assistants population, and its share of long resident nobles with their mansions and villas too. Northward has always had this image of quiet respectability and is a relatively safe neighborhood. Few bother to inquire as to why, but the truth is that since shortly after Agarin's passing, it's been the home of no less than nine dragons who spend much of their time in human shape and who long ago quietly modified the famous dragon wards of the city to not see or act on them thanks to enspelled tokens they formerly wore which which they long ago embedded in their scales. Laryl warns me that these are not the only past tokens that let draconic beings ignore or freely bypass the city wards and some of the items with this function have surprising forms. If you come across references to the Silent Nine in Waterdavian writings of the 1360s, which was when others, notably apprentices in Blackstaff Tower, first noticed them, though these inquirers were soon encouraged by the Blackstaff to attend to their own business and fall silent on this particular matter, these dragons are who's being referred to. To this day, the Silent Nine acting individually more than collectively, though they like each other and work together whenever necessary, keep watch on criminal activities, red wizards and dragon cultists, and spies of the Arcane Brotherhood and others who take up residence in Northward. And these are numerous, as it's a preferred area to live in if you're not an official envoy or ambassador, but do represent outland interests in the City of Splendors. I've named some of the Silent Nine in various places down the years, such as my Worms of the North series in Dragon Magazine, but of more interest than their ages and the fact that their silver and gold dragons are the aliases they currently use. They change these from time to time to conceal their unusual for humans longevity, building fictitious heritages and very real careers for their human guises. These include Avali's Moondwindwinter of Sashtar Street, a quiet, bespectacled, raven-haired woman who makes her living as a seller of maps and books. Haldron Methland of Horn Street, an amiable, solid-looking elderly man who's respected as a good restorer and reforger of swords, daggers, scabbards, and sheaths. Emthira Emberhair Burlherrn of Stallion Street, a coppered crimson-haired woman easily recognized for her ankle-length fall of straight hair, who works as a woodcarver making household trim adornments such as curlicued or fanciful creature adorned lock plate surrounds, door frames, window frames, and door panels. Her specialty is carving a relief portrait of someone to go on their own front or bedchamber door. And the Lion of Lion Street, Mal Ross Maroon Lion of Lion Street, yes, a weapons trainer and seller of used armor and shields who was once a mercenary company captain and successful adventurer. He's an alert, long, black-haired, red-skinned, eagle-beak-nosed man with odd yellow eyes and a swift smile. The Silent Nine prefer not to drop their human guises, so if you force one of them to, be prepared for unpleasantness, and be aware, too, that they are cunning, know the city very well, and have access to arsenals of magic weapons and items, including some rigged to be parts of rather effective traps that guard their city residences. Every one of them owns secondary or even tertiary properties they can take refuge in, and they also all have at least one current alternate human persona they can assume if their main role seems to be attracting persistent attention. 
The Silent Nine are believed to have been responsible for the disappearances of several North Ward residents in the 1470s and 1480s DR, one of them a professional assassin from Kalamshen, Irvild Murultam, who came to the deep to assassinate a guildmaster, succeeded, and stayed to see if sufficient coin could be had by covertly offering merchants, gilded and not, chances to conveniently eliminate rivals in return for fees. After two takers, the Slayer vanished without trace. Though as one of the nine put it, that's not quite true. I spat out his boots. If you're enjoying this video, please leave me a like or subscribe. If you want to see other videos in the future, please hit the bell icon. And if you want a steady stream of realms lore, please jaunt out to my Patreon, Ed Greenwood on Patreon, and consider becoming a protector of the realms. What meets the eye? Many buildings in Northward have been reclad in light limestone and adorned with balconies and exterior hooks and brackets for hanging lamps and plants. Open archways into sheltered porches, so someone opening a front door is sheltered from rain and snow, are a common feature, as are ground floors with lofty ceilings. Streets are clean and watch patrols are frequent. Only Sea Ward is better served in this civic respect. This is also one of the greenest wards of the city, by which I mean prevalent in green growing things that are tended and were planted deliberately, as opposed to vines and shrubs growing well on Mount Waterdeep, as in Castle Ward. Window boxes and hanging plants are numerous and thriving, as the ward is sufficiently close to the sea for the damp that plants need, but far enough away to keep the sea salt down. Balcony gardens are abundant, and even rooftop gardens are beginning to appear. Although the northerly expansion of the built-up city has made the air here a trifle less clean and clear than it was in the later 1300s DR, North Ward is more free of unpleasant smells and drifting smoke than any other part of the city except the upper flanks of Mount Waterdeep and the heart of the City of the Dead. North Ward is home to Trollskull Manor, an older rundown North Ward residence that began as a baytont, which in Waterdavian slang means upper wealthy class splendid but not showy or gilded, and which features in Waterdeep Dragon Heist, and I'll repeat that description here because it's a good baseline for most of the older housing stock in North Ward. North Ward is one of the most prosperous wards of the city, so the ground floor of any manor would be mortared fieldstone. There'd be a level concrete floor, stone-lined cellar level below that, not connected to any other buildings, and as Trollskull is older construction and not of the most expensive, yet is a manor, its second floor would also be a fieldstone. Inside these walls rise the support timbers of a box-framed truss, with any floors above the second, including the attic, being half-timbered, what in our world is often called Tudor, exposed support beams with decorative white stucco between them, which is overcoated wattle and daub. The roof would be tiled, overlapping hump-shaped rectangular roof tiles that overhang the walls by at least a foot and have downspouts, and the lime ash floors throughout would be covered with flat glazed tiles. The house would have garderobes, or if you prefer, jakes, internal toilets slash washrooms, flushed by roof cisterns, operated by a pull chain, down interior wall pipes into the sewers. It would have internal stairs and closets between rooms for sound privacy. Bed chambers would be on upper floors. Attics would be for cisterns and old furniture storage and sometimes the rearing of caged pigeons as meat birds for the household and the servants would sleep in the kitchens. Pantries and entry room for added security. There would be heavy wooden doors for interior rooms with exposed stout wooden frames and the only place where there might not be doors would be a wood framed square arch connecting the largest ground floor rooms a dining room and a main room, what we might call a parlor or lounge or living room. A typical manor would have a main stair, perhaps with a landing, wide enough for furniture, and a narrow servants or back stair that might be a circular stair to save space. A larger manor than Troll Skull, in other words, a mansion in everyday Waterdavian converse, would have straight run, less steep, wider stairs. 
Windows would be blown glass in small diamond frames. Replacements can be readily purchased from the relevant guild or a used goods shops, and most houses have one or more over windows in storage that can be fitted over a broken pane window temporarily until repairs can be made. With shutters inside and outside that can be fastened open and grand houses may also have balconies. Sliding wooden pocket doors are an innovation for the grandest rooms that likely came along too late for Troll Skull unless it was remodeled before the player characters come upon it. Fine chain pulley hanging from the exposed ceiling beams, oil lamps or candle lanterns, in either case having hemispherical, frosted and perhaps tinted glass bowl shades to curb down glare, are the norm in main rooms. The Neighbors North Ward is one of those places in the city where folk might not know their neighbors except by sight and from a distance, even after years of residency. They tend to mingle in their own groups, based on family, friendships, and business relationships, which may or may not include other North Warders. However, residents of this ward do share a sense of belonging to a community, which in an earlier century was even called High Clear, as in here, we're high and clear, meaning higher up from the damp and reek of the sea and of Dock Ward in cleaner, clearer air. The name has fallen out of use, but the viewpoint it represents of being above a lot of the squalor, noise, and crowding of much of the rest of the deep remains. Local oddities. Like every part of Waterdeep, however, North Ward has its eccentrics, its secrets, and its dark tales. One of these is the Clutching Skeleton a human skeleton animated as a prank by Alderman Stonecloak, a North Warder resident wizard of middling level in the 1300s DR. This mindless assembly of bones appeared out of thin air, teleporting to random locations in North Ward to grab at the nearest living person, seeking to poke and clutch, but not harm. It's thought Stonecloak created this frightening nuisance as a response to a rival wizard publicly contending that he was no good at necromancy. The skeleton was an annoyance that suffered a lot of damage from annoyed persons striking back at it, but he repaired it several times to send it forth again. And then someone else, identity unknown, cast new spells on it to take control of it and make it far more deadly using it as a night assassin against targets all over Northward who were presumably the someone's foes or who'd crossed or angered the someone. Stonecloak disappeared in the midst of this new career for the skeleton and many believe the someone took care of him permanently. The career included several slayings followed by the skeleton's destruction three times. The first two shatterings of the skeleton triggered magical explosions that did great harm to the destroyer of the skeleton and the immediate vicinity, but the third one simply ended the skeleton. From time to time since, the same someone or a copycat has briefly sent other skeletons to clutch in North Ward, but the Lords of Waterdeep passed a specific law imposing heavy fines on involvement in this or any similar pranks, and after two individuals, both in other wards, were so heavily fined that one of them lost his city home over it, the clutching skeleton prank lost its attraction. For now, North Ward also has its inevitable treasure tales, tavern embellished stories of this or that cache of lost riches that lie waiting, hidden somewhere in the ward, for a lucky person to find them and become fabulously wealthy if they can survive to enjoy their windfall. These include the usual pot of coins or gems walled up in a garret rented by an ailing retired sea captain to decay his or her last days away in, and the successful bedchamber sneak thief who died transfixed by the blades of bodyguards in a noble mansion in Seaward, and so never returned to his North Ward home to lift the right step of his back stairs and uncover the entrance to his secret treasure vault. I decry these tales because they're retold everywhere, details amended to fit the locale, and if they were ever true, may pertain to a place distant indeed from North Ward in Waterdeep. However, there is one treasure tale distinct enough in its details to be clearly of North Ward, and that's the story 
of the sculptor of Imar Street, a dwarf by the name of Dorlan Spikeshield. Dorlan was white bearded and bald, never spoke of his clan. Spikeshield was a name he invented on the spot when pressed by a city tax collector and lived alone and modestly in a ground floor north front shop and cellar. He rented out the floors above to others to live in. His shop was a labyrinth of carved stone statuettes, doorstops and ornamental bowls. He worked constantly and it wasn't until after his sudden disappearance from the city in the late summer of 1486 DR that someone dropped and broke one of the statuettes he'd sold them and discovered it had a cavity at its heart crammed full of bloodstones, more than 60 of them. This led to a race on the part of several competing opportunists to buy up and shatter all the spike shield stonework they could find. The results? Not a bowl or doorstop contained anything but the stone it was made of, but every statue, large or small, hid treasure. Almost always gemstones of various sorts, but all of them cut and polished, not raw. And the searchers came too late. After Spike Shield vanished, someone had broken into his shop and removed scores of the statues, though their cumulative weight suggests they weren't taken far. Over 40, however, remained, and the watch came and set up guard on the premises until the watchful order could arrive and spell seal it. When the civic authorities entered a 10 day later, however, they found unknown parties had entered the shop covertly from below using existing hidden ways rather than breaking open a new route and taken away the remaining statues into the sewers, or rather a small local section of the sewers for the dredge screens that divide the sewers into small local sections hadn't been disturbed. The cellars and sewage outflows of six score North Ward buildings empty into that particular section, so the statues must have been taken into one or more of them. And there, the trail ends, so far. Civic workers report no new appearances of stone rubble in that sewer section or the alleys and streets of North Ward, though ground fine rubble can be introduced into concrete and hidden that way. Why was Spike Shield hiding gems in statues he then sold? And where did the jewels come from in the first place? Where are they now? Mm. Locals to beware. North Ward, like any district of the city, is home to some interesting individuals. And here are three. Lady Monster is a human female of mature years. More specifically, she's the tall, good-looking, perpetually smiling Merthra Dunvelgeld of Tower March, who makes a living breeding and selling monsters and sending hired adventuring bands all over the Sword Coast North to procure living or dead monsters and monster parts for interested clients. She has a purring voice, long unruly hair that was once jet black but is graying with age, and claims to be a retired adventurer from Chacenta. The front parlor of her home, South Front Tower March, north of its moot with Immer Street, is full of trophies for sale from antlered skulls to tentacles in jars and fangs as long as a human forearm. For a single gold dragon, she'll connect you with a likely to meet your needs band of adventurers who live in or have a contact in Waterdeep. Monster procurement prices and the prices she sells monster relics at must be individually negotiated. There are rumors she works with a band of doppelgangers and has unusual visitors in dark hours such as drow and mind flayers. One tale even says her bedchamber is guarded by a grell. Several sources say she's very friendly with certain masked lords of Waterdeep and the heads of several noble houses. Very friendly. The Mighty Man Spider, or formerly known as Orbrowl Harhamath, is a middle-aged, paunchy, short, and dark-haired human male of nondescript looks who can shape-change into a giant spider with the usual spider-climb, bite, and web abilities. He has a ground-floor office and shop beneath his rented rooms where he grinds lenses for monocles, magnifying glasses, pier sticks, lorgnettes to us, glims, pince-nez to us, hard glims, eyeglasses to us, and star shields. 
which are decorative shields on stands that enable adjacent lanterns and candles to project images or patterns onto walls. His work is superb, but the price is high, typically 50 gold pieces per lens. He's quiet, polite, and even prim, and hums to himself as he works. He enjoys grinding, shaping, and polishing. Orbrell bottles up all anger and disgust inside, lets it stew, and when it builds into a seething rage, he shape changes and goes hunting to cause pain and redress personal slights, and sometimes to slay. He's not brave and prefers to lurk and pounce to open challenges and fights. He's not above knocking foes cold and then webbing them into thick cocoons to suffocate. Recently, mounting bills and slowing sails forced him to begin stealing from victims, and he takes glee in doing this and has begun to amass quite a fortune. But he sticks to coinage and trade bars and easily resold unmounted gems, tools, and weapons. No jewelry or anything distinct or identifiable. He fears roaming in spider form near the palace and the castle and in Dockward, but he has ranged all over the rest of the city. Orbrell nurses grudges and has a superb memory for faces, names, addresses, and amounts owing. Vressa, Ironhund, is a tall, broad-shouldered, hook-nosed, blonde, and brown-eyed human female with striking, bushy black eyebrows who habitually dresses in dark leathers. She maintains a shop on South Front Serdun Street, three doors west of Thunderstaff Way. Ressa's Sweep Be Gone, where she hires herself out to sweep North Ward and Sea Ward buildings of rats and mice employing tiny snapshot treadle cages, large capture boxes, closed shoulder strap carry satchels she empties full cages into, and a variety of cantrips that can lure, sear with beams of intense heat, tug with sticky tendrils that race from her fingertips, and blow, sucking or blowing wind gusts short and intense in cylinders of air no larger across than her palm. A typical sweep takes about three hours and costs 25 gold pieces if she catches nothing, but 50 gold pieces if she catches anything at all. Several Sea Ward residents have used her to recover alive pet snakes that escaped and hid in their residences, and she can also use her tug tendrils to retrieve keys, gems, and rings that have fallen down pipes or gaps. Vressa doesn't gossip, but she's seen and heard a lot about her clients over two decades of work. She lives alone, by choice, but has several lovers, caravan merchants, all of them half-orc females, who stay with her during Waterdavian stopovers. On several occasions, she's been accused of working with gangs of thieves, or being one herself, but the Watch, assisted by the Watchful Order, have investigated her thoroughly twice and found these rumors unfounded. She has been seen to go drinking with harpers and wizards visiting the city, but it's not known if she's a harper herself or is trying to bargain for new spells and cantrips or just happens to have longtime friends who became harpers. The neighbors all know Vressa defends herself with a quartet of enchanted flying daggers that dart about under her mental control and, if she's struck senseless, will continue to try and execute her last command. She sometimes casts cantrips on these daggers so that they trail billowing smoke to provide visual cover or glow to illuminate a dark area, deliver verbal messages over and over again, hey, listen. or adhere firmly to a cord to pull it along. Vressa wears a cummerbund that stores a 75-foot-long coil of strong black cord. Increasingly, nobles in Sea and Northwards have come to trust Vressa and hire her to cut down on small, scurrying rodent problems. And that's a look at Northward. Hi, welcome back to Realmspeak, and this time around we're doing this. This is the marker of the first High King of the Moonshay Isles. It's the cairn, pile of stones, the cairn of Humri Hyu. You can pronounce his name in all sorts of different ways, even if you're from the Moonshay Isles. Depending on the vowel and the accents of your particular village, it could be Kamrik, Himrik, 
there could be a Rick in the end there, or there could be even be a Simric, which I've heard on some occasions. And of course, the poor mainlanders don't know what to say. But yes, it's the Karen of Umric. So, emphasis on the first syllable, Kum, Kumric. And it depends on, again, your voice, whether you go Rick or Rick. You, you shorten it or broaden it, but I would say Kumric, Hugh. So, it isn't Hugh the way a, an American guy would say, Oh, my friend's name is Hugh. Although, you know, if you're from the Vilhan Reach, you may indeed end up saying you. But if you're from the Moonshays, it'll be you.